Good morning. We've had a few technical issues, but we've gotten taken care of just just now. So, welcome to our live streaming worship service of the Church Church of Christ. I want to thank you for worshiping with us today. Our bulletin is available on the website, and it has a list of those who need prayers. Please check the website and the Facebook page for updates. Communion supplies are available at the building. Please call the office and make an appointment with the secretary. Our giving on our weekly basis can be done by mailing it to the building, dropping it off at the building, or we can keep it at home until we meet again. Our elders have decided to suspend all assemblies of the building until May 17th. And that's next week. We plan to be here at the building at 1030 for worship only. We also plan to meet only on Sunday mornings at 1030 for the last three Sundays of May. That would be the 17th, 24th, and 31st. The elders will be reevaluating and will make another or make further decisions prior to June 7th. And it's Mother's Day. To our mothers, happy Mother's Day. We appreciate you and we see each and every one of you as a great blessing of God to your family and to all of us. Please join me in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for being our God, our Father, our Creator. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for all the rich and wonderful blessings that you give to us each and every day. Please continue to bless the church here, especially during this time that we are physically apart while we worship. Bless our families and continue to keep us safe. Please deliver us from this infectious disease outbreak. Bless those who are working on the front lines, the doctors, the nurses, paramedics, emergency medical personnel, and the researchers who are looking for treatments to fight against this disease. Again, Lord, we we come to your throne, we bow, and we recognize you as the Almighty, our Creator, our Judge. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. Please let our worship to you this morning come to your throne. May it please you. In Jesus' name, amen. The first song we'll sing this morning will be number 168, Heavenly Sunlight. 168, Heavenly Sunlight. <clears throat> Let us sing. Walking in sunlight all of my journey, all of the mountain, through the deep vale. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee. Promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with Glory divine, hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, resting my way to mansions of all, singing His praises, gladly I'm walking, Walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. 
The next election will be number 366. There is a place of quiet rest. 366. There is a place of quiet rest. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless, redeemer. Sent from the heart of God. O Lord, who went before thee, near to the heart of God. There is a place of full release, near to the heart of God. A place and peace near to the heart of God. O Jesus, bless Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us who went before thee near to the heart of God. This time I have a lesson for the Scott Springer. Good morning to everyone, and let me repeat the well wishes to our mothers that Tim did. Happy Mother's Day to you all. We're so very thankful for you, and we love you. If you would, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 5 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 5 through 10. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, or earthen vessels, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. I'm sure most everyone is familiar with the story of Aladdin, you know, the young boy, homeless boy, who found the lamp and rubbed the lamp, and Robin Williams, or Will Smith for the younger people, popped out of the lamp and, of course, gave him any three wishes that he wanted. Well, Remember the end of the story, he turns into a prince, kind of, and everybody ended up living happily ever after. Well, I read a different story about another man who found a genie, and uh, he became something else entirely. The story goes that a man is walking on a beach, and he, beco- he comes across this old bottle, and he picks it up, takes the cork out of the bottle, and whoop, out comes the genie. Well, the genie says, well, thank you so much for freeing me from this bottle, and for freeing me, I will give you any three wishes that your heart desires. The young man says, great, I've been looking forward to this. I've always dreamed of this kind of opportunity where I've got to have three wishes, and I know exactly what I will ask for. He says, my first wish is that I would want $1 billion in a Swiss bank account. The genie says, simple enough, your wish is my command, Whew. Here it is. There was a great flash of light, and the young man looks down in his hand, and he has a piece of paper that is a bank statement from a Swiss bank, and he has $1 billion available to him. 
And he goes, okay, well, great. I know what my second wish is going to be. I would like a brand new red Ferrari 488 Spider right here next to me. That's a really fast, expensive car, by the way. He said, I want that brand new red Ferrari right here. And the genie says, simple enough, your wish is my command. Poof, there's a flashlight and there's his brand new Ferrari. And he's just as happy as can be. And the man says, okay, I've got the money, I've got the car, now I need the girl, of course, he said. So I, I, my final wish, my third and final wish, I wish to be irresistible to women. Jeannie says, boy, that's an easy one. Your wish is my command. Poof, there's a great flash of light, and the young man is transformed instantly into a box of chocolates. So... I wish there was more laughing here, but there's only four of us and we're spread about. I hope you're laughing at home, at least laughing at me. But uh, nevertheless, let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, because I, I really wonder what would happen. I wonder what would happen if something like that were to be real, where somebody, one of us would be granted any wishes that we would desire. You know, would we be happy? If we were just given anything we ever wanted, would we be happy? Would we have joy? Would we be content if we suddenly could be granted any three wishes that we desired? Well, you know, sadly, the answer is probably no. You know, just from looking at people who play the lottery in this world, you know, what usually happens or sometimes at least happens to people that win big in the lottery? Well, you know, a few years later down the road, they're usually poorer and sadder than they were in the first place because we, we know from our own experience and just from wisdom that, that, that our happiness and our contentment it's not going to be found in physical possessions. You know, if, if we can't be happy with who we are and what we are and what we have today, we're really never going to be happy. And, you know, I, let me show you something. I don't know if this will show up very well on the screens at home, but if you're able to see what I'm holding in my hands, you'll be able to recognize what it is immediately. And I maybe I can open it up a little bit and you can tell what it is. You know, this is a box that women especially like to see, maybe on Christmas or with a birthday card or maybe especially with a man kneeling down on one knee in front of them. This is a ring box. This is a box that a normally a ring would be in. And, you know, the thing about it, you know, this, this particular box is from Zales, which is a very popular jewelry store. And, you know, what's in it could be worth a few hundred dollars or it could be worth many thousands of dollars. It's actually empty. But, you know, depending on what the value of what's in this box is, you know, the price tag on the box could vary greatly. You know, to be many, many thousands of dollars depending on what's in the box. However, if I take that ring out of the box, what do you have? Well, really, if I take the ring out of the box, it's really just a worthless piece of cardboard with a bit of cloth and padding. That's all it is. You know, there's nothing special about this box. The only thing that makes it maybe kind of special is the shape and that it's recognizable. We are able to look at it and know what's in it even before we open it, and we know that it usually holds something that is very valuable, something that is a great treasure. But, you know, the, the question that I'd like us to consider here this morning is this. When you look at yourself, when you consider yourself, and how valuable you are, what do you see? What do you picture yourself as? Do you see yourself as being valuable and rare? Do you see yourself as being remarkable and unique? Or do you see yourself as just one among seven plus billion people here on this earth, just like everybody else, nothing special, no better or worse than anybody else, but just the same? Really what I'm talking about is, is self-image and self-esteem. And, you know, that's not really a topic we talk about a lot here as a church family, but maybe something that we need to talk more about because, you know, the Bible does talk about our self-image. It does talk about our self-esteem and it does tell us how we need to view ourselves, what a good and healthy look at ourselves would be like. Did you know that the Bible actually teaches us that we are to love ourselves? Well, of course it does. If you look at Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 39, we all know that verse. That's where Jesus says that we need to love our neighbors as ourselves. And of course, we know that's the second great command, second only to loving God. But he says, love your neighbors as yourself. And did you realize that inherent in that command is the fact that if we're going to love our neighbors, we must also love ourselves. 
We must love ourselves. God expects and even commands that we should love ourselves, that we should view ourselves as being valuable, that we should have a good and healthy self-image and self-esteem. You know, uh, this morning I hope you've turned to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where our scripture reading was, because I'd like us to spend a few minutes looking at this passage, because I believe that it will help us to develop a proper self-image, to have a healthy self-esteem. And, you know, just, just so we understand what we're talking about here, a self-image would be how that we view ourselves, and this is maybe an oversimplification, but our self-image is how we view ourselves, and our self-esteem is how we feel about that, how we feel about our role, and how we feel about what our life is like. Are we content? Are we satisfied? Or are we depressed and discouraged when we consider our lives? Well, friends, you know, this, is, this shouldn't be a question for us, really. I know this is a difficult thing for many of us, and you know, some of us suffer from very low self-esteem sometimes. Sometimes we are very discontent in life. But friends, the Bible says that those things should not be iffy. These things should not be contingent on what's going on in life. As a matter of fact, if you look at John chapter 16 and verse number 22, when Jesus was talking to his disciples before he was crucified, he says, I'm giving you a joy, I leave you with a joy that no man can take away. He says, joy is not contingent on anything except for on salvation. We have salvation There's that we, have, we should have joy that can never be taken away. And our contentment should not be contingent on anything, but we should always be content. Paul said that in Philippians 4 and verse number 11. He said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. We should always be content as Christians. You see, if we have no joy in life, if we aren't content in life, Maybe it's because sometimes we are fixated about wanting to change something about ourselves. Maybe we're fixated about wanting to change something about our situation and really not understanding that we have the solution all the time. You see, very commonly people develop their self-image and their self-esteem based on how valuable they feel that they are to the world. You know, maybe they, they, they base their self-image and self-esteem on how much money they have. The more money you have, the more valuable you are to the world. Sometimes people base it on their jobs. If you've got a white-collar job, then you must be very valuable. But if you're a, a blue-collar worker, oh, you are just a working grunt that exists to support the more valuable white-collar workers. It's not true at all. But sometimes people base their self-image and self-esteem on that. Many times people determine their self-esteem and self-image based on their health their talents, their abilities, or how many friends they have on TweetBook or InstaFace. You know, they, they, they base their self-image on all these different things. And I know sometimes we can fall into those same traps as well, but you know, I'm going to ask the question, which of those things does God care about? Which of those things makes any difference whatsoever to God? You know, we, we, as Christians, we may not worry about the money or the insta-face or anything like that, we, but we may be looking at ourselves and saying, well, I'm not as valuable as some other members of the congregation because I don't lead in worship. I haven't been there as long as others. I haven't been a Christian as long as somebody else. I don't put as much in the collection plate, and I don't teach a class, and so therefore I may not be as valuable as somebody else. But again, I ask you the question, which of those things does God care about? Does God care about how much money you have? Read James chapter 2, the beginning of the chapter. I think he will give you a resounding no. He doesn't care about that. Does God care about how many talents you have? <laughs> Read Matthew chapter 25, and specifically the parable of the talents. I think he'll tell you, no, I don't care about how many talents you have. Does God care about how many years you've been a Christian? Read Matthew chapter 20, and the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. I think he'll give you the answer of no. He doesn't care how long you've been a Christian. Just the fact that you are one. But if you aren't a Christian today, does that mean that you're any less important, that you're any less valuable, and that God somehow does not love you? Absolutely not. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and it was while that we were yet sinners that Christ died for us, Romans 5 and verse number 8. And it is all of us, every single one of us, that God wants to save, First Timothy 2 and verse number 4. You see, none of those measures the world would apply towards value matter to God. All that matters in the eyes of the Lord are that you are part of his creation. You are created in his image and for his glory. And in his eyes, that makes you very valuable. 
Well, I'd like us to continue to consider here what is said in 2 Corinthians 4. If those facts that I've just very briefly mentioned aren't enough to help us to have a good and proper healthy self-image, let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, Paul's talking here about some of the challenges that we face in spreading the gospel. Uh, some of the challenges that we face in doing that, and also, in, most importantly for us this morning, he's given us some encouragement for persevering through those trials. And he gives us the knowledge of why that we are fit to perform this great task that the Lord has set before us. Now look at verse 5 again. He says, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be manifest in our body. Now, verses 4 and 5, you're looking at this. He gives us our purpose and our reason. He says that we go out and we preach Jesus. We go out and preach Jesus. Not our own ideas, not our traditions. And we do this because God has shined this light into our hearts and he wants this light, his light, to be spread toward all. But then verses 8 through 10 gives us the challenge. He gives us the challenges that we face towards our purpose. He mentioned some of the ways that Satan tries to stop us and tries to keep us from doing what the Lord has told us to do. He says, we're troubled, we're perplexed, we're persecuted. You know, that that's happening right now. And he says all of this is because of the fact that we're carrying the message of Jesus. But in all of this also, Paul points out that it's not causing us to be distressed. We're not in despair. We're not forsaken by God. And no matter what the world throws at us, We're not going to be destroyed or forsaken, verse number 9. You know, I think that takes quite a very healthy self-image and self-esteem to make it through these kinds of troubles and still be strong. We've all faced troubles. We've all faced trials. We've all had tough times. We've had friends turn on us. We've all been disliked. and We've all been criticized by different people at different points in time in our lives. And it's easy to let those things bring us down. It's easy to feel distressed or discouraged or depressed. And it's easy to start feeling like other people are treating us that way because we're less valuable or less special. But there's two things that I want us to notice in this passage that I think are very, very helpful. Specifically, they're from verse number 7. And I believe these are the perfect solution to help us achieve that proper self-image and a very healthy self-esteem. Number one, Paul points out that we're just earthen vessels. And see, what Paul's talking about here is is just something like a clay pot. Nothing of great value, nothing of great beauty, but just a common clay pot or pitcher that would hold water or flour. And in a way, he's saying that the physical things about you, you know, we aren't really special in that way. We're not really more valuable than anybody else in that way. You know, wait a minute, Scott, I thought you were trying to build us up, not bring us down. You just told me that we're commonplace. We're no better than anybody else. Well, hold on a minute. We're not done yet, but hear me out. You see, in that way, physically, from what separates us from everybody else, we're not special in that way. In that all people here on this earth are all equal. We're all created in the image of God. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, young or old, black, white, brown, or even neon green. We're all equally valuable in the eyes of the Lord and equally useful within his hand. He says, you are an earthen vessel for the work of God. So we're not special in that sense, and neither is anyone else. So it doesn't matter if somebody makes more money than you. It doesn't matter if anybody has more friends or more talent than you. You are just as valuable as everyone else, and they just as valuable as you. So don't let anyone tell you any different. But the second thing we need to notice here in verse number 7 is this. Paul says there is something different about you. As a Christian here this morning, Paul says there is something different about you that separates you from everybody else in the world. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, verse 7, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And notice here, Paul says that we, again, Christians, these earthen vessels, not flashy or special, we have something very special 
within ourselves. We have, as he says here, a great treasure. You see, just like that ring box that I showed you earlier, we physically may not be anything particularly fancy, different, or rare. We're just earthen vessels. But Paul points out here that we have something rare, something beautiful, something valuable within within us. We have a treasure. Now, of course, we know what that treasure is, don't we? And if we can remember that we have this treasure within us, if we can remember that every single day, don't you think that we would be helped through our trials? Don't you think that that would help us? If we could just remind ourselves, hey, I have a treasure within me. Don't you think that would help us through all the different things that we just read about in verses 8 through 10? And we know what that treasure is. We know what that treasure is that helps us to endure through the trials of life. We know what that treasure is that helps us to have a proper self-image and healthy self-esteem. It's the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the saving grace of God. Friends, there's a few things that we need to realize about this treasure that we have within us. It is something that we should all be encouraged by. It is because of this treasure, this salvation of God through grace and our faith that will never die. It is because of that treasure that we can have strength to drive through all the problems and trials of this world. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, excuse me, Colossians chapter number 4 and verse uh, 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16, I apologize. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16, he says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet, we're, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. He says this treasure, and the knowledge of this treasure is what encourages us to keep on going. Number two, not only is this treasure something to be encouraged by, but it is something that we can be proud of. It is something that we can be proud of. You know, something like that ring in that small box that I showed you earlier, it makes that box in a way very, very valuable. And we didn't understand that as we carry the treasure of God within us, it makes us extremely important and valuable because we what we have within us. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 20, Paul goes on to say that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are representatives of Jesus here on this earth. He makes his appeal to the world through us. And that makes you very, very valuable within the hands of the Lord. But, you know, I, I don't mean to say that we're just an empty box without that treasure. We also need to understand that even without that treasure, you were the most important and valuable thing on this earth. You were a part of the creation of God. You were a precious soul that he wants to save. But we need to be very proud of that treasure that we hold within us. Not a selfish and foolish pride of ourselves, but proud to bear the name of Christ, never ashamed to share that treasure. And third and finally, not only is this treasure something we can be encouraged by, not only is it something we should be very proud of, but also this treasure is something that we should be humbled by. Another key thought to the message that I'd like to share with you this morning is that we're not special and that we don't have this treasure within us because we're more talented than other people. That's not what makes us special. We're not special and we don't have this treasure within us because we're richer than other people or better in any way than other people or that because God somehow favored us above other people. That's not what makes us special. But we're special and we have this treasure within us because we chose to have it. We chose to put Jesus on in baptism, to receive that gift of eternal life. We chose to accept his gift of grace to, and to accept that great responsibility of being God's representative here on earth to spread his word. We have this treasure because we chose. But first God chose to extend that offer to us. And the thing is that I'd like to ask as we come to a close this morning is, if you don't have that treasure within you, why not choose to have it right now? If you're not a Christian today, know this. Your soul is the most valuable thing here on this world. And it will be the most valuable thing in the next world as well. And if you choose to accept it, God is offering to you a very great 
valuable and matchless treasure, a treasure for you to share in this life and a treasure for you to be saved by in the next. You can have that treasure. Just because we're not here at the building together, just because we may not be able to be with you presently, doesn't mean you can't accept that treasure. Be baptized today. Accept the Lord Jesus in your life. Or, if you are a Christian and your self-esteem is not what it should be, remind yourself from this passage here and others as well, that though you may not be physically stronger, richer, smarter, or better, better looking than anybody else in this world, there is something within you that puts you on par with the very best of humanity. You have within you the greatest treasure ever known to man. And that, along with so many other things, makes you very, very special. Let's sing together. Prepare a pie at the Lord's Supper. We'll sing number 634. In my love, the Christ grows weak. 634. In my love, the Christ grows weak. <clears throat> when my love to Christ grows weak, when the deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to thee, garden of Gethsemane. When my love for man grows weak, when for stronger faith I seek, if Calvary I go to thy scenes of fear and woe, then to life I turn again, learning all the worth of pain, learning all the might that lies in a full sacrifice. Seven hundred years before Jesus came to the earth, Isaiah prophesied that he would have no form or comeliness for us to esteem him highly, but he would be esteemed by God, by God to be stricken with our sins. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. You would take your communion uh, materials and bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this bread and for what it represents, the body of your Son, Jesus, who came and died that we might live. In his name we pray. Amen. You would please bow with me. We'll pray for the cup. Our dear Father in heaven, again we approach your throne and we thank you for the sacrifice of your son and for the blood that was shed on the cross 
for each and every one of us. We thank you, Father. Please accept our worship to you in memorial of him. In Jesus' name, amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Again, we often have the contribution afterward. If you would please keep that at home or make a, uh, either mail it to the building or bring it to the building uh, with an appointment. Thank you. The closing song. Before the closing prayer, is number 532, The Lord is in His Holy Temple. 532, The Lord is in His Holy Temple. The Lord is in His Holy Temple. Keep silent before him. Keep silent. Keep silent. Keep silent before him. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day you have given us. Thank you for everything that you have made. Thank you for our ability to, so we cannot meet in person, to worship you individually. Lord, if it be your will, Help us to come back together and to take what we have learned and to apply it to our daily lives. Lord, please help us to walk here in our way and please forgive us when we sin. In your sense of holy name, amen.